So a conscious consumer is somebody who um, is aware. So somebody who walks into a shop and understands the history of plastic, the history of things, where they come from and why they're there, and doesn't just accept it at face value, but then understands um, how it could be changed and how we could do better. Um, so yeah. I'm not saying that everybody has to go out and do something, but just the fact that you're thinking about it, you're engaging those conversations and you're putting that lens on, that's a conscious consumer to me. So thank you for coming tonight, everyone. We will be discussing the history of plastic and its overproduction and its overconsumption and then maybe how we can actually um, move forward from all of that. So just kind of an agenda for tonight, um, introductions. I am Madeline. I'm the marketing and brand awareness coordinator at Stand. And we have Amy with us, who is also the engagement coordinator at Stand. And we are running the conscious consumption campaign this summer. And we also have Lindsay O'Connell with us from Voice, who will introduce herself in just a moment. Um, we will then kind of look at what plastic is, what its history is, and then actually taking action against plastic use. We have a bit of an interactive part of the session for everyone about how maybe you think we could actually take action. We'll have a Q&A with voice and then some final thoughts. So Lindsay, if you wanna kind of tell us who you are and what voice is, we'd love to hear from you. Sure, um, first of all, thank you very much for inviting us on today. It's a really important conversation and uh, we're honored to be here with you. Um, so Voice is a really great organization. We've been around for 25 years. So we're one of Ireland's oldest running environmental NGOs and we're all about waste. Uh, we're basically linked to the sustainable development goal number 12. So it's about responsible consumption and production. Um, and so for 25 years, we've been advocating for a more circular economy and a move into a zero waste economy basically. And I'll go on to explain what that means later on. Uh, and the main ways that we do it is three ways. So we do it through education and we go on the ground to communities and individuals and we show them what, what being a responsible consumer is, how you can do it, et cetera. And then we do it through support of business and industry. So we get them, we show them how they can reduce waste in their business moving forward. And then we advocate as well through um, our political um, submissions to government. So we would sit down with them. And what we always say is in voice, we build bridges, we don't throw bombs. So we very much sit down with all the stakeholders at all time. We do have a few direct action campaigns uh, like Sick of Plastic, where we, we do that in com combination with Friends of the Earth as well. But mostly we are, we're a friendly kind of go-to environmental NGO. Beautiful, thank you. So we'll get started on actually looking at what plastic is, which is kind of, it's everywhere, but I don't know if everyone knows what it is. So um, originally plastic when like it was first kind of theorized was just supposed to be something that was pliable and moldable and easily recreatable. But obviously now plastic is a bit more complex. It's become a category of material called polymer, a polymer. And a polymer, poly meaning many, it's basically long chains of repeated molecules. And there are natural polymers. So that's things like resin or rubber or silk. And there's, there's things like that. But plastic actually falls under the category of a synthetic polymer, which is made from non-renewable resources. So made from coal, natural gas, and oil, which is why there's kind of an issue with it, you know? It, it's not um, infinite, and even though we act like it is <laughs> infinite. So um, I don't know, Lindsay, if you have any kind of input there, but if not, we can just kind of move on to how plastic is actually made. Uh, no, no, that's all perfect. Perfect, okay. So plastic, to, to make it you, it, you start by drilling for oil, and what you find is crude oil, which is basically like a chemical soup. So it's extracted from the earth. And then this soup of all kinds of materials is sent to a refinery where it's heated up to whatever temperature, very high, that moves them all. And the lighter materials move to the top, the heavier materials move to the bottom. And those that oil is separated into molecules. So once those are separated, that's sent to a chemical treatment plant. And those molecules are linked up to make different types of plastic. So that means it, it could be like a floppy type of plastic that you use for or these strains. It might end up being something that's like Tupperware or it might end up being something more crystal-like that 
you put around like building materials and things like that. So once they're linked up, then whatever kind of um, plastic link this is gets turned into a pellet and this that chain of molecules is a pellet. And then eventually that's molded into whatever plastic product that we know and love. So that could be your plastic bottle, that could be your toothpaste bottle, that could be the bristles on your toothbrush, it might be in the fleece that you're wearing, it, it, it's in basically everything. But one of the main issues with plastic being made is that when we're heating up all of these things and when we're smashing together all of these molecules, that's when kind of toxic chemicals come about and then that ends up in our groundwater and it ends up in our food and it ends up in our clothes, it ends up in everything. So yeah. plastic is a bit of an issue as we all know, um, but basically how plastic gets made and what the story of plastic is, is oil getting into everything that we have. So the plastic timeline, um, kind of the history of it, and Lindsay, I'll, I'll move over to you in just a second, but um, you can probably give us a more in-depth story here. But basically, the first plastics plastics were invented in the late 1800s, but these were made from partially, you know, natural resources. And then, you know, they actually ended up developing into what we now know today, kind of in the 40s, 50s, and 60s. And during World War II, plastic production actually increased by 300%. So whatever plastic there was on earth before then, it really came to be in, at the magnitude that we see it now during the Second World War. So as the plastic industry was booming, the problem maybe for the oil companies and the plastic industry was that they had all these amazing products, but there wasn't really a culture of just using things one time and getting rid of it. Um, and they had to teach people how to just dispose of things. And ultimately their goal was to have as much plastic in the bin as possible. So um, <laughs> the consequences of plastic use were obviously evident pretty quickly, but there were continuous campaigns and always back and forth, even now, obviously we're here today, um, between plastic and oil industries and lobbyists and environmentalists and activists and just anyone who you know, doesn't want to see plastic constantly surrounding them. But I don't know, uh, Lindsay, if you want to give us a bit more there on, on what kind of like the history of, of how we got into using plastic so, so much. Sure. Yeah. Um, the first thing that always strikes me that, you know, I, 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 I write about plastic and I, I learned about plastic, but I still always remember the first time I heard the link between the oil industry and plastic. I was so shocked by it. I didn't yeah. realize that the majority of the ingredients into plastic is actually from the oil companies, you know, and that still shocks me today. So uh, personally invested as well. If I look at my window, I said this to you guys earlier on a second ago, there's an oil refinery across the water. I'm in Whitegate in East Cork. And so I can see firsthand the huge crude oil ships coming in every day. I can see the big pipes. I can see where they filter down the oil and change it and the trucks that drive through our village. And I think Whitegate supplies 40% of, of the country in Ireland and so all these trucks are flying in every day and they're collecting their oil and you can see how dependent we are on it still mm -hmm. unfortunately and um, but you can see why because it's valuable to us and um, it's it, it is kind of an amazing invention it's in our children's you know helmets and cars and airplanes and things like that and um, but it's just been abused and unfortunately that's what we need to kind of solve the issues on so um, we've gone from 15 million metric tons in the 1960s producing of plastic, it's a big number, 15 million metric tons, to 368 million metric tons. So that's a huge jump in the amount of plastic that we're creating. And there's a reason for that. It's, it's basically to bolster the, um, the profits of the oil company. So it is a marketing plan. It's a business plan to produce more plastic. So if we go into that idea of plastic with that lens on, and that understanding of why we're seeing it around, it helps us to understand why there's so much of it and why it's so difficult to get rid of. So we have what it's 368 million metric tons is what you said? 368 million metric tons. Yeah, so the, the question begs itself like, okay, well, can we just recycle the plastic? Like, why can't we just reuse all of the plastic that we have on the planet and be happy for it? 
Well, the problem is, is that recycling is a, like a really succinct definition is taking something, breaking it down and then turning it into the same thing again. So when you recycle aluminum, this happens. It is, there are carbon emissions and things that are the consequence of recycling that, but you, you have aluminum, you break it down, it becomes aluminum again, and then you can reuse it to make whatever aluminum product you want. The problem with recycling plastic is that it's actually nearly impossible to, by this definition, recycle plastic. Because when you recycle it, it's actually degrading and breaking down and it doesn't turn into the same exact type of material that it was before. And so then you can think of it as maybe it's only being downcycled. So it, it gets maybe one more life, maybe two more lives where a plastic bottle gets turned into fleece that you have in a jacket that you might buy from a sustainable place. And then what happens once that fleece, it can't really be made into anything else. So it makes it a bit difficult to have anything but a linear, linear economy or a recycling economy. And it it's kind of leaves us in a really confusing spot. So I don't know, Lindsay, maybe you can tell us a bit more about like how we could actually move to something that's more circular and what recycling I don't know, looks like in that process. Sure. Um, so the big misnomer that we've been sold is that recycling will be the answer to all of our problems, but only 9%, roughly 9% of all the plastic that's ever been produced has gone on to be recycled. So um, we don't do recycling well um, in this country, especially uh, we recycle 31% of our plastics here. Now, although that meets the EU um, regulations, we're nowhere near where we need to be soon uh, for the new targets that are coming down the line. And right now we're working at our maximum capacity to even get that amount of recycling done at 31%. So recycling actually isn't the answer to all of the problems that we have. We need to look at it completely different. And what we're doing now is we're looking at this pyramid um, and reduce refuses at the top. So if you don't need plastic in the first place at the design stage, when you're a producer, if you don't need plastic, get rid of it, you know, so refuse is at the top you have reuse refill at the uh, underneath that and then way down the bottom is recycling and then and, and throwing out then and putting into incineration energy um uh, or or throwing it out into the bin kind of thing into the landfill so at the very top is reduce reuse refill and then way down at the bottom is recycling so we need to move away from this idea that we can recycle our way out of problems because we really can't yeah i know another point about recycling is is that a lot of the like weight of the shoulder, like a lot of that is shouldered by the consumer. Like we're told we need to recycle. It's all on you. Yes. Make mm -hmm. sure that you are putting everything in the correct bin, but there's also a lot of misinformation there. And it's, mm -hmm. it, it's really difficult to always be conscious of, of where you're putting your recycling. So I, could you maybe just tell us a little bit about like why so much of the like weight of that process is put on the consumer. Yeah, it's greenwashing. It's totally greenwashing. So uh, I don't know, I have this sense of paralysis when I'm standing over my bins. I've gone to the shops, I've bought what I need. I've had to take home this packaging waste. And then mm. I'm standing over the bins and I'm trying to read the label at the back, you know, not currently recycled in Ireland or check your waste collector provider. That's not my job. My job is to be able to go into a supermarket or a shop and buy consciously if I choose to, to have that option there um, as standard. So when I walk into supermarket, I want to see my, my groceries loose. I want refill options. I want reduction in plastic. And then I don't want to have to, you know, shoulder the burden of making sure that packaging goes to the right place. And as we know in Ireland, the labeling isn't very good. So for example, if a coffee cup says to you that it's recyclable, in Ireland, you can't recycle a coffee cup. It is non-recyclable. It will always go straight into the general waste. If they say it's compostable and you don't put it into a compostable bin, it will end up in general waste where it releases more methane than its non-compostable co counterpart, you know? But none of this information is told to us as consumers. So I know we're gonna talk about the single use plastic directive in a second, but part of that is better labeling. And we really need that to take the onus off the customer and put it back on the producer. Yeah. So now that we've kind of looked at the, the one little kind of action that maybe might help <laughs> moving forward, I, I think it is important to note that like plastic inhibits development in any kind of thing. So if we ever want to be in a circular economy, plastic inhibits that from being fully realized. 
And it also works against any kind of sustainable development that we hope to have for the entire globe. So obviously our actions against climate, it's important to note that any kind of action that happens in any kind of upsetting thing, like if we're only recycling 31%, where's the waste going? This kind of climate degradation disproportionately affects different communities and adversely affects communities that produce the least amount of waste and are least responsible for generating that waste. So while none of the 17 SDGs actually have plastic pollution as a main theme, it's clear that there is a relationship between curbing plastic pollution and um, you know, actually seeing a developing world. So the four that I've kind of picked, I mean, every single one of them you could look at and say plastic inhibits this from being realized. But the four that just we could kind of look at today are good health and well-being, clean water and sanitation, responsible consumption and production, as you said, Lindsay, is kind of what you guys focus on, and then obviously climate action. So the first for good health and well-being, it, I mean, I, I don't know if anyone's seen any studies or anything, but plastic is in our food. You can find microplastic in water. And realizing that the two realize good health and well-being, there has to be an absolute reduction in plastic production so that any kind of environmental factors that are imposing health risks on us um, are no longer present. And then we can actually continue to develop into having good health and well-being. Can I come um, in there, Madeline, just to say, yeah. to emphasize what you're saying, um, and you're so right uh, to link it with plastic, because we don't know the full health impacts of all the plastic. Plastic doesn't break down. It's there forever. It breaks into tiny little microplastics that stay in the environment. And we still don't know how that's going to affect our health. If anybody's interested in this, there's a website called chemtrust.co.uk. And they do all the tests on different kinds of plastics and the different ingredients in them. And it's linked to endocrine disruption, obesity, cancers, um, and some horrendous health uh, defects. Um, not to kind of be too negative and, and all the rest of it, but <laughs> there is a huge health implication for, for, health, for plastic that a lot of people don't know about. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I mean, it, that kind of the microplastics kind of ties into this clean water and sanitation and climate action. If it's constant, it's always there. At some point, it will end up in front of us or it will end up in a developing nation. And what are they to do about it? So um, I think this might be a nice time to look at maybe the more hopeful <laughs> part of this. Um, I'll stop sharing here in a second. Um, and Amy, if you could send over the Miro board to everyone. We'll pull it up and um, we'll look at kind of three different categories of taking action against plastic and plastic pollution. So first looking at individual action, what can I do in my own life to maybe reduce the impact of plastic? And then looking at how you can fight for corporate responsibility and keeping corporations and organizations in line with the goals that we want, which is preventing plastic from entering the environment, avoiding more health risks, and realizing an, act, an actual reduction in plastic production. And the same with governmental action. How can we hold governments and institutions accountable for this? So I will pull up the mirror board now, and if anybody wants to put in their ideas for how they can take action or how they already take action, we would absolutely love to see it. Okay, cool. If you want to keep adding more, feel free, but I, maybe we can start by just going through each one. We'll look at individual action, then look at, um, just briefly, look at keeping corporate corporations responsible, and then looking at governmental action. So I guess, does if anyone wants to speak up over me, feel free and tell me about, or tell us about why you put what you did. There's a bunch of really, really interesting options, like Lindsay was saying. So I don't know if anyone wants to Hop in, I'll give you a second here. But there's some, um, I know there, one of them says, get into the habit of reading the packaging on all products that you buy. So I don't know, Lindsay, are there specific like labels that maybe you're supposed to look for when, when you're looking at that to see if it is actually recyclable or is what would be maybe the best course of action for that? Okay, so at the very okay, beginning, so at the time, have I got an echo on my, is everyone, can you hear an echo now? 
there's no I think you're good yeah okay cool um at yeah. the very beginning we always say to people um check with your local waste provider so generally in Europe um you munis municipalities would look after the waste collection services but in Ireland we have privatized that industry so we have hundreds of waste provider collectors and they all have different places waste uh, sorting centers that they go to and um, so what we would always say is check with your waste provider so if you're using city bins or if you're using panda get a list from them it's usually on their websites and they have labels then numbered and that tells you what plastic um which plastic is what and where it goes so always check with your waste provider first because it's not a one fit all solution then i would recommend you go on to mywaste.ie and that is the yeah. national waste um information service and that will tell you exactly what you're supposed to be able to recycle and where you're supposed to be able to recycle it um, unfortunately, we don't have on the street recycling and stuff like this, so it's all household recycling that they're talking about, really. But labeling is really important and part of the single use plastic directive um, that was transposed into law on Saturday past has to yeah. do with better uh, labeling because we're getting misinformation and we're getting yeah. labels that's coming from the UK where they have different systems and we're getting that to come from the continent. So what we need is very specific Irish labeling um, and it has to happen soon because it would help people a lot more. Yeah. Thank you. We can maybe look at one more on this individual action, which is replace anything possible in your own home work life with sustainable or reusable options. So like a metal or bamboo lunchbox or a canvas shopping bag. So I, I have a question there maybe for you. And this is kind of jumping into Q&A before Q&A even begins. But <laughs> um, would you say that it maybe is better to go ahead and buy new sustainable things or is it more sustainable to just reuse what you have until it dies basically? What, what do you think on that kind of point? Yeah, the logic there is use what you have. Um, and that's the kind of mentality we need to get into is that when we buy something, we're not looking at it for a single use, we're looking at it for longevity. So if you have something that you can reuse and use and use, like my, you know, I've got these plastic kind of keep cups that my parents bought back in the day, thinking, you know, this is the answer to all of our problems. And we've just kept them because they're useful and we'll, we'll continue to use them. Yeah. Yeah. Perfect. Okay. So we'll take a look at uh, how can I fight for corporate responsibility when dealing with plastics? Does anybody want to pop in here or are we, are we good with me just continuing to, to, to talk? Whatever, anyone else? Corporate responsibility in Ireland is quite a tricky one as well because we don't have all the statistics for plastic output by producers. Mm. Um, we have to request that information. So at the moment, through our Sick of Plastic campaign, we're writing a grocery report for the grocery sector. And what we're saying is we need to have supermarkets telling us how much plastic they're producing. And um, they do tell Repack, but Repack don't share it publicly. So what we're asking for is that to change. One of these options is boycott companies who refuse to do better or who place profit over sustainability to a dangerous degree. Do you have any like clue on how maybe you find what companies are not <laughs> adhering to sustainable standards or your personal you know, ethics around sustainability? Do you have any? Yeah, most um, most companies now know that they have to be somewhat sustainable. So what you really need to look out for is greenwashing. And it's very easy to see the greenwashing when you go onto a website. They're talking little things like we've removed all the plastic from our birthday cards or whatever. Like that's something very minimal. They're not talking in big quantities and big numbers. So have a look at the do a bit of an investigation yourself. But there's also other apps that you can use as well that document how businesses are doing and they'll rate pennies and they'll, they'll put them up against other um, shops. Just give me a second and I'll tell you what that's called. Um, Yeah, good on you. Do you know that one? Good on you. Yeah, I do. I've heard of it before. Yeah. yeah, it's a great one. It's a really good one. Yeah. But again, it's all about investigating. Unfortunately, we don't have a comparative analysis of how shops are doing in Ireland. Um, but we are keeping a close eye in the grocery sector with their sickle plastic campaign. Um, but the, at the end of the day, they're all going to have to comply. EU legislation is coming down um, the road and they're going to have to reduce the amount of plastic that they are producing. Um, so there is good news. 
<laughs> That's great to hear. <laughs> yeah, I know um, there is. <laughs> so the last kind of bit here, if anybody wants to speak up, you feel free. But yeah, how do I encourage governments and institutions to do better? And there's actually like quite a lot of options people people put down here, but the one that I'm looking at here is if having unsustainable policies is a deal breaker for you, then start voting differently and do your research. So I think maybe that's a really important thing to note here is that like local elections are just important as national elections and things like that are really important to look at. And when you have the opportunity to do so and vote for people that align for you, it, it's really important because those actually make a lot of difference, even if it's just like a local election, it, it does make a difference on what's happening in your area. We can't over, anyone... I can't overemphasize as well, just, you know, email your local TD. Uh, a lot mm -hmm. of people think that everybody does it, not enough people do it. And if they see like consumer power is huge, but so is uh, voting power. So if you email your local TD and tell them your concerns and tell them what you're interested in. And if you go onto our website and you see ways that we are advocating for different policy changes, you can copy and paste what we're advocating for and send it in an email. It actually does make a big difference. Into um, our Q and A with you, Lindsay, but maybe before we have questions from everybody, if you could just tell us a little bit more about what Sick of Plastic is and, and what Plastic Free July is, because I know that's kind of an important part of, of what this is, which is an even grander scheme against plastic. Sure. Okay. So Sick of Plastic campaign was set up three years ago, set up by Voice Ireland and Friends of the Earth. We basically came together and realized that the majority of the, of the waste that we were finding in the household bins was to do a packaging waste. And the majority of that was coming from supermarkets and shops and places like that. So we came together and we decided to put pressure back on the supermarkets because it was felt that the retailers had a lot of sway when it came to producers and how much they were producing. And they could use their clout and their weight to push back on producers to say, our customers don't want plastic so we're, we're not going to take your plastic on our shelves. So we started by doing a direct action campaign called Shop and Drop, where we were um, asking people to go into a supermarket, do your shop, and when you get to the end of the till, after you've paid, and very politely to the people who work behind the counter, hand back the plastic and say, no, thank you, we don't want this anymore. Um, it started off really well. We have 70 active groups around the country. Uh, who continue to do this and because of it Lidl and Aldi now have recycling stations at the end of their checkouts usually in all of their shops where people can drop back the unwanted uh, packaging. Tesco's now has this recycling center as well where they use this recycled material or the soft plastic material and they turn it into things like um, in car parks those kind of barricades and things like that. So where we do appreciate the fact that they're listening they're focusing on the end of life solutions was whereas the point is we want the eradication of waste in the first place and um, so we're still campaigning back in january and december we sat down with little aldi dunn's voice and oh, voice dunn's and tesco <laughs> And we sat down with their sustainability, sustainability managers and we said to them, look, you know, some people are going to push back if they say loose fruit and veg, you know, but for the majority, for the environment's sake, for the EU directives that are coming down the road, we have to reduce the amount of plastic. And it just makes sense. This is the low hanging fruit. Will you take all the plastic off the fruit and veg, please? And will you give us refill options like porridge and lentils and nuts and the things that we buy day to day all the time that I could bring in my own containers? Because essentially I'm going home and just decanting it into what I have. So let's just cut out this plastic middleman. The majority of the supermarkets were like, refill, what's that? I was like, no, no, don't lie. You've had it in Lidl in France since 2017, and you're just playing delay tactics over here. So a lot of what we get here is what's been fed down from the UK. Um, so the UK are moving slowly towards refill. We know it's going to happen eventually. We're just wanting them to move a lot faster on this and as quickly as possible. So at the moment, we're producing a, gro a grocery report where we're really going to work with the government's circular economy strategy. And we're going to ask for refill targets. So we're going to say that each supermarket has to dedicate a certain amount of its ground to refill. So 30 percent or whatever it is. And then they'll have to comply. Beautiful. Yeah, we'd love to see that. <laughs> it's such a great campaign. So you can get involved. It's fantastic. <laughs> Boom. So you can get involved uh, on our social media or through our websites, Voice Ireland or Friends of the Earth. And if you want to like get involved, you can direct action, drop your plastic back at the supermarkets. You could drop a letter into the manager saying, I want as a customer less plastic. You could write to your local TD. We have sample letters and emails that you can take as well. Or you can join our campaign because we're going to get a lot more direct action once COVID finishes. It's fabulous. 
And if you took the pledge, you'll actually get all of those resources and you'll be directed to all of that from 10,000 students. IE as well. So before I have, I have some questions for you, but I just want to let anyone know if they want to pop in, they can ask a question, just unmute yourself, or if you want to throw it in the chat, we'll keep an eye on that. Um, yeah, so if you have a question, just let us know. But I know you've been talking a lot about this EU directive, Lindsay, and, and it started, I think, in 2019, but then the single-use plastic ban was just this year. So maybe you can tell us a little bit more about that, and then is this like actually a win or is this just like, like, are we moving forward or, or what is, what is happening? Ah, it's always like a pinch of salt though, <laughs> isn't it? Like it's never a hundred percent win. That would be too much. I wouldn't have a job. I know. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah, so the Packaging Waste Directive uh, came down, it's from the EU Circular Economy Directive, and it's actually really good in loads of different ways. It's deadly because it's forcing countries to have set targets for their recycling and things like that, and that's exactly what we need. Um, and it's also telling us through the single use plastic directive um, what we have to get rid of, what's in the, like, you know, really important to get rid of. So what happened was on Saturday, there's different kind of provisions in the single use plastic directive. So on Saturday, provision five and pro provision seven kind of came into law in enforcement. And what that means is we banned the most commonly found uh, littered items. So cotton buds, plastic knives and forks, cutleries, that kind of thing. Um, and then it all has to do with labeling requirements, provision seven does. So it means that we have to step up our labeling game and, 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 and look at what that means for Ireland. Um, so it is a great thing that the EU are thinking more circular. And because of that, Ireland now is doing the same. And because we have uh, the Green Party, which are in coalition at the moment, we're finding that we're moving very quickly in, in the right direction, but there's still a lot more to do. So what we're advocating for is, yes, these are low hanging fruit, like I said before, these are kind of things that we should be getting rid of anyway, but let's move to refill. Mm -hmm. So what would a refill economy look like, right? Imagine this. So you go into a shop or a takeaway, you get your food in a beautiful kind of reusable, re refillable container. You don't need that anymore. So there is like drop off points that you can put it in. It gets cleaned by some sort of refill infrastructure and then it goes back to the supermarkets to be used again as packaging. So it's circular. Say you're at home mm -hmm. and you need, you know, an ankle grinder because everyone needs an ankle grinder on a Friday night and you don't have one. So you go to your local reuse library and you you get one and you pay you don't have to pay for it but it's all reusable so we all have all this stuff in our houses that we don't use all the time instead of having mm -hmm. these kind of libraries and central points so a reuse refill uh, economy makes sure that everything that that surrounds us has a purpose but not just one multiple yeah so that's what we're advocating for and what we're trying to push towards beautiful world <laughs> yeah. so you mentioned the green party and alex actually has a question for you okay. they said i was wondering what you think of the green party i feel like they often don't do enough but we have very limited green voting options in such a small country do you think it's more about making personal green choices Oh, that is such a good question. Big question. <laughs> yeah, it's a really good question. Uh, the Green Party, uh, I think, are doing really, really well. I think they're making very good strides. And I think it's exactly the kind of voice that we need in government. Um, how they're doing in a political sense, in a PR sense, that's a different story. Um, no, they're, they're actually doing really well. And they're pushing forward all these directives. So Ireland has been heralded as one of the leaders when it comes to the single-use plastic directive. But again, we could be doing a lot, lot more. Um, personal consumption fits in with that. It's not a this or that. Uh, the more the people move towards zero waste stores or buy more consciously, the more the producers and the retailers see that there's a benefit for it, then the more the customers are pushing back on, on the politicians. It has to be kind of uh, multi-dimensional. It's not just a one fix solution. So being a conscious consumer, uh, contacting your local TD and encouraging the Greens to do more is kind of the tr like triple prong approach that we need to be doing. So um, as an individual consumer, um, I, I know that making green choices is, it sounds easy, like, okay, of course, I'll be the perfect consumer. Yeah. Um, but sometimes that can be extremely overwhelming. And all of a sudden you think, oh my gosh, um, I have to do everything perfectly or the world will end today. Um, so <laughs> what do you suggest for dealing with this kind of guilt, especially when you see that there's plastic everywhere around you all the time. Oh, it's that, it's that eco anxiety, isn't it? I think we all mm -hmm. get it because once you put that lens on, you can't unsee it. 
Um, but I genuinely see a huge shift coming down the line. And the more people who are talking about it and the more people who are going to their local zero waste store and the more they're educating their children about it. And it's, you know, for example, right, I assume the plastic has been here forever. But if I talk to my grandmother, she's like, no, 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 it's a new invention. You know, it wasn't there when I was younger. I was able to return my milk bottles. We had refill reuse systems so we can get mm -hmm. back to that place again. Um, but I would try to leave it to the politicians to do the big jobs and um, do as much as you can, but then be kind to yourself and allow yourself to switch off as well, because every little thing that you do makes a big difference. The power of one is huge, you know, mm -hmm. like and we can see that through all these actions and hatch the Me Too and um, all the different campaigns that have happened around the world. It's look at Greta Thunberg, like look at the effect that she's having on people. So the power of one is huge. Keep doing what you can. Um, but change is coming down the, down the road. Just keep pushing for it. Absolutely. So Rachel had kind of the same question, but she also wanted to know, because um, I, I think most of the people who are attending tonight are students, it can be expensive and inaccessible to be sustainable as a student. So do you have any like thoughts about maybe working towards being more sustainable without a budget? Yeah, I remember it well. I went back to do my master's there about 10 years ago in the UK and I was broke. I was so broke. Um, but I found that with the reusable items, I was actually getting, okay, there was a little bit of a commitment when it came to money initially, but I was getting more out of it. So 10 years ago, I found out about the moon cup, for example, if I was having my periods. And yeah, it was more expensive than a packet of sanitary towels, but I still have the same moon cup, you know? So I have um, a benefit from it. And students are great at research. There are alternatives out there. Uh, you just got to do a little bit of digging, unfortunately. Um, but what reef, what's great about refill is that if you can look at things differently and learn to appreciate things for being able to use them again, and again, and again, and you get into that mindset, mindset for the rest of your life, then it, it's completely different. You're actually getting value out of everything instead of being single, you throw away, you know, yeah. a long term investment. Yeah, that's it. Beautiful. So we have a few more minutes with you here. Um, and if anyone else has any more questions, again, feel free to put them in the chat. But I think now might be a nice time to talk about how you can actually take action um, and, and what the Conscious Consumption Campaign is and why we're here tonight. So the Conscious Consumption Campaign that we're launching this summer um, is with 10,000 students. And it is all about that power of one that actually ends up being a massive change. So if, if every single one of you tonight took a pledge, then that means however many, I don't know how many people are in the call, but that means that many more actions are being taken for a more sustainable future. Amazing. So this specific campaign is aiming to bring awareness to the impact and importance of our purchasing power and our consumer habits and how that affects political change and social change, like you were saying, like how we may actually end up in a refill land again, basically, like it's possible. So if you want to, if you haven't already, you can take the pledge on 10,000students.ie and you can read more about the actual campaign and why we've chosen this topic for this summer. We also have a few more events you can register for. We had this one on plastic consumption. We have another with Fair Trade Ireland happening in two weeks now. Um, about global trade and being an ethical consumer and looking at supply chains and things like that. And then we have another event at the end of the month with Ethicart, and that's looking at, at kind of the innovations that are happening to create a more sustainable world and impact entrepreneurship. And then finally, um, I don't know, Lindsay, if you want to say anything about anything more about any of your campaigns, but I think one huge part of this is that you share <laughs> on social media and with your friends and with your family, all of the things that you're learning tonight. So like this will be recorded. You can show this playback to any of your friends and get them on board as well. But Lindsay, if you wanna add in anything else, feel free. Yeah, um, if you want any more information about what we do at Voice, if you're looking for some experience or if you wanna get involved in any of the campaigns or you wanna do an internship, more than welcome to contact me. I'm at lindsay at voiceireland.org. Um, and we've got loads of really fun uh, campaigns. So if you're more about the Conscious Cup coffee or Sick of Plastic, or if you want to find out more about the deposit return schemes and things like that, just pop onto our website and any way you want to get involved, just hit me up. Beautiful. Thank you. So Amy, I think if you just can put that last little bit in the chat with all of the links for everything. Um, before we go, Lindsay, if you could just give us one last 
kind of, if you were to think of a definition for what a conscious consumer is, what would that be? Yeah. Okay. Um, I'm just <laughs> typing. I can't do two things at once. Um, <laughs> I'm just changing my email address there. It's Lindsay of Voice Ireland, just in case. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Amy. Um, so a conscious consumer is somebody who um, is aware. So somebody who walks into a shop and understands the history of plastic, the history of things, where they come from and why they're there, and doesn't just accept it at face value, but then understands um, how it could be changed and how we could do better. And um, so yeah. I'm not saying that everybody has to go out and do something, but just the fact that you're thinking about it, you're engaging in those conversations and you're putting that lens on, that's a conscious consumer to me. Beautiful. So give me one second here, everyone, and I will give you all the links. Um, but if anyone has any, it's okay, Amy, we'll get it. Um, if anyone has any other questions for Lindsay, feel free to let us know now and we will wrap up in just a moment. Perfect. So before we leave, yeah, if everyone can just fill out that survey for us, we would love to hear your feedback and we will be in contact with you just once more, send you all of the resources that we've given you tonight, giving you, like, giving you ways to access all of voice, Voices work, um, how you can get involved with 10,000 students this summer. And um, yeah, so if anyone has any further questions, let us know, but I think that will be it for us tonight. <laughs> Thank Amy you, says, thanks so much. Lots of non-plastic wrapped food for thought. So <laughs> <laughs> nice, Amy. <laughs> Beautiful. With that, everyone, we can sign off and I will stop recording now. Thank you. Thank you guys. Lovely to be here.